And the other major goal and aspect of the system is legal argumentation, so that you can configure with the data which you get from these tests your system, create legal arguments, and then in real time use this legal argument at court, for example. So we have seen in the previous presentation that um, major requirements in substantive patent law can be broken down into elementary requirements and then can be mapped into specific tests, these 10 FSTP tests. From the perspective of legal argumentation, you take the results, you, have, you create with this test a particular data structure, you can enrich this data structure with data coming from the particular patents which you analyzed, provide these data then into certain subtest structures, and from these subtest uh, sub structures, arguable subtests, you then can create legal argument chains and can provide access to these legal argument chains using certain interface entities. These interface entities, depending on what kind of access you want, can have different knowledge representation formats, starting from formats which are more natural language oriented, so for human consumption, to more mathematical oriented representations, as we will see then later in the, in the next presentation. Additionally, of course, you need management interfaces um, for the human interaction, for example, so that the humans can control this whole legal argumentation system and interaction control in general behind the scene in the back end that you have some control about this whole process. So um, this functionality, the major aspect here is you want to create legal argument chains. Here are some simple examples how such a legal argument chain tree might look like. You know, so for example, you can say the claimed invention satisfies your substantive patent law. Then you start the next uh, sub-legal argument, the claimed invention is well-defined, so because the claimed invention is well-defined, then you define what are the arguments why it's well-defined, the claimed invention is well-defined, because all inventive concepts are disaggregated, as justified, then you give a legal reference, um, which justifies this disaggregation, which basically is the result of the disaggregation test, um, in this case 112, and then you uh, have all the inventive concepts and then you give evidence for the particular inventive concepts that they are actually disaggregated by pointing to particular uh, parts in the text uh, which are marked up in a computer oriented representation in this data structure which I mentioned at the beginning. So that's part of this argumentation for well-definedness. Then you take the results from the next text which um, here is uh, disclosed lawfully you again give the legal reference as justification and then provide the arguments from this test and providing evidence from the textual provisions in your particular patent. So that's then part of um, one subtree in this legal argument chain for well-definedness. Of course, uh, you would also need to give all the arguments for the other tests of well-definedness. <coughs> and since our, our main point was to show that this satisfies substantive patent law, we then need to switch to the other tests and um, for basically argumenting the other requirements in substantive patent law, like then in the end, for example, patent eligibility, and then you have the different tests for the patent eligibility. So that's, that's the underlying idea of presenting arguments and with these um, sub-arguments, creating legal arguments chains, which then can be used in real time at court for legal argument argumentation. So if you take such a text for humans, if you want to interpret, if you want to read that text, it's relatively easy. It's natural language. Humans can easily spot certain things, can interpret that, like substantive patent law, that's a legal concept, because the context here is US, we know that uh, this covers 112, 103, 102, 101, and so on. Well-definedness, novel and non-obviousness, patent eligibility are specific legal norms defined in um, the uh, substantive patent law textual provisions. We can spot legal requirements like disaggregation, which are then mapped into our specific 10 tests. References can be easily spotted by humans, legal, which are used for the legal justification. Or, for example, then legal argument facts, where we then point to certain marked up um, textual 
statements in the particular patent attend, which then also can be easily interpreted by humans. The problem now with machine interpretation basically is that this syntax, this particular language, completely looks different, namely like this. So a machine does not understand anything of the things which are written there. So if we want to provide a system which can actually make use of such information, we need some kind of additional information. Typical solution, most of the industry solutions nowadays for providing some kind of structure, semi-structured knowledge or information representation, use XML, XML text to give some additional structure about information, represent this information, interchange this information, for example. So we can also do that, add, for example, this additional semi-structured information in terms of metadata text, um, saying, for example, substantive patent law is a concept, novel, non-obviousness, patent eligibility are legal norms, uh, references, so that's the third example, which references uh, 112, first paragraph, and so on. So we have a reference here, marked up units, um, which point to particular XML marked up textual information from the patent, and so on. So we can do that. That helps machines, of course. Nevertheless, from the interpretation point of view, it still looks different, namely like this. So now machines know that there is some different information provided by this XML text. They can use this XML text for certain processing, like split, splitting the text, but still they don't understand what this particular tag actually means, which then would give the machine some information how they can actually interpret such information. So from the syntactic point of view, this semi-structure helps to process information, but from the semantic point of view of understanding information and transforming this information into real knowledge, uh, that's not enough. So we still need more. Namely, we need some background information which provides such semantic information, such semantic knowledge, in such a way that machines can actually make sense of this information and can use the semantic background information for knowledge interpretation. The typical approach here in computer science for knowledge representation, semantic knowledge representation, is that it uses logic-based languages. These are formal languages, typically symbolic languages, where things which we want to represent in the world are represented by certain symbols syntactically. Um, logical first-order logic language, for example, subsets of first-order logic languages, that's our syntax. But the important thing now for this interpretation is that in addition to the syntax, we also provide the semantics. And the semantics defines how machines can make meaning interpretation out of these sentences, which we represent in our formal language. And this approach is used for declarative knowledge representation. So knowledge is represented in such formats. There are engineers or modelers who try to model the things in the real world in such formal languages. And then, because the syntax, this model, this modeling language which we are use has a semantics, we can simply give such a model to a machine, which is called an inference engineer, and then this machine can use the semantics to make interpretation out of this information. So that's the underlying idea. And by having this formal semantics, machines now can do a meaning interpretation of the syntactic information. To give you a concrete example, again stressing this point that XML itself is just semi-structured, but in principle you need some additional semantics. If we have, for example, this bit of information represented in XML, we have a tag called course and then some value as an attribute, semantic web, so the name of this course is semantic web. As a sub-element here we have the professor teaching this course is Adrian Paschke. Syntactically, we can have a completely different XML representation now, so a syntactically different model where we have, for example, the XML element professor, name Adrian Paschke, sub-element teachers, and then the value here is semantic web. So syntactically, these are two different information representation models, but semantically, it's in principle the same meaning, namely Adrian Paschke is a professor teaching 
semantic web. So from the knowledge interpretation point of view, we have different syntactic representations. The interpretation leads to the same semantics. This um, can be also represented then in more formal languages like in first order logic, where then the semantics of first order logic can be used to allow this inference engines to come up with the interpretation of such information. The problem now is if we want to design such a system which uses a formal language, that the users which actually want to represent the knowledge and which have the knowledge want to encode this knowledge are typically the domain experts. So they are not the computer scientists who implemented such a system or know about the underlying formal languages and how to represent that in logics. They are the domain experts, lawyers, attorneys, who have the knowledge and who want to represent the knowledge. So from the syntactic point of view, we need a knowledge representation language which allows such domain experts to specify their knowledge in this particular syntax, but nevertheless the syntax should have the semantics so that machines can understand it. And therefore an approach um, which came up uh, in a standardization body from OMG distinguishes into th three different layers of um, modeling representation languages information or knowledge representation languages, namely languages which are computational independent modeling languages. They typically use a syntax which is human oriented, um, like for example English as a natural language, or graphical representations or other kinds of representations which are easy to understand for humans. But these languages need to provide a particular semantics. And one way to specify the semantics is that we provide a particular semantic structures using the natural language. Um, that's then called structured English. There are also other approaches which use, for example, controlled natural languages where then you can build a semantic discourse of this language and then can try to find out what's the semantic of the language. Then on the next layer, as I said, XML languages are quite important for machine processing. That's the typical uh, language accepted by industry and standardized by, indus uh, by standardization bodies for knowledge and information interchange. So then it's possible to map such natural language oriented languages into XML representations so that machines can process it. The important thing is that all elements, all texts which are defined in these XML languages have a precisely defined semantics. So it's not just an XML structure, it's an XML language which has a defined semantics. And there are standardization efforts also in the legal domain which standardize such XML languages, defining the semantics or defining the underlying reasoning processes. One is, for example, an oasis um, called Legal XML, which then has sub standardization bodies, for example, for using XML languages for rule representations, that's legal rule ML, or using XML languages for legal citations, legal doc ML, and so on. And then from this platform independent layer, XML layer, it's mapped into a platform specific language, which typically are languages which can be directly executed and interpreted by such automated machines, so inference engines. That can be then directly formal languages. Prolog, for example, is a typical subset of first order logic languages which provides highly efficient reasoning support. But it can be also that these languages are then directly compiled into executable code and then are executed by uh, procedural machines. So that's the underlying idea. Since these languages have a defined semantics and when we map from one layer to the next layer, the important thing is that the semantics during this transformation, during the mapping from one layer to the other layer, should be uh, the same. So we should have an isomorphic mapping from the interpretation which we have in the structural English to the interpretation which we have in the XML representation to the interpretation which we have in the formal representation because we don't want to have different conclusions or different results if we map from one language layer to the next language layer. It's like this example which I showed with this XML, we can have different syntaxes, but the semantic interpretation, semantic meaning should be the same. That's the important thing here. And that's why um, defining the semantics also on the natural language layer is quite important. So I will now focus on, in the, for the rest of the talk, mainly on this 
higher level uh, of computer independent languages. One approach um, where we exploit such structured English languages is for representing legal arguments in terms of such natural language structured English representation. Uh, that's an approach which evolved from a related community, namely from business rules community, where they standardized a language for s describing the semantics of business vocabularies and business rules representation. And a similar approach can be also adopted in the legal domain. The underlying idea is that we predefine the vocabulary which can be used in this language. And part of this vocabulary definition is that we define the semantics of the vocabulary. So the typical building blocks of such a vocabulary are rules, which um, allow us to derive certain inferences, certain conclusions from these rules. That's typical reasoning process. And then the definition of the underlying concepts, which can be used in this language, and the relations between these concepts, which are typically called here facts, fact modeling. So we have then a relation between one concept to another concept or between multiple concepts. So that's the underlying idea. Um, these kind of languages often use some kind of uh, encoding of the semantics. Uh, one particular approach is to use color coding and underlying. So in the approach of structured English, for example, red identifies certain keywords which have a predefined semantics in this language. Uh, underlined teal identify certain nouns, uh, legal items, for example, attributes, and so on. Then in italic blue, identify verbs that are the relations then between two concepts. And in gray, that are individual concepts, so which have a specific value. The um, underlined teal in light blue, they are concepts which can be instantiated, so where I can have multiple uh, instances for this particular concept, whereas the gray concepts are typical individuals, like a specific data value, a specific number, and so on. The whole language itself, including also the, how the language itself is defined, as I said, the semantics need to be defined, and that's done in terms of meta models. So a meta model basically describes what kind of modeling primitives do I have in my modeling language, and how are the relations of these primitives. So that's predefined, which leads to this particular structure, and that's why it's called structured English. So how can this approach then be used? So we start developing this vocabulary by defining certain concepts claimed invention, for example, and then we need to define what claimed invention as a concept is. We define, for example, claimed invention is disclosed, disclosed by a patent specification, and then we can define all kinds of relations that synonym forms are, for example, the technical teaching, or in our mathematical model, um, we say that's our TT0. And then these concepts which we use for the definition or for defining synonyms forms, again, can be defined. Uh, by new definitions in the mathematical model, we would, for example, use then a mathematical definition. We can attach metadata information, what's the source of these definitions, give certain additional uh, information for the, pre uh, for the interpretation. But the core idea is that um, we can define concepts, can relate concepts to other concepts, and again define these concepts, like technical teaching. Technical teaching is described by inventive concepts any inventive concept represented by a legal fact and a technical te fact for testing the patent, technical teaching and reference set, that's the inventive concept, and so on. Uh, there's one example in gray, lawful disclosure, which is an individual concept, uh, which in principle is already an instantiation of this concept, which where the synonym, for example, is or can be sufficiency of disclosure. So just to give you some examples how such vocabularies can be defined, this whole approach is grounded also in standardization. Uh, that's a standardization in ISO, an in industry standardization for terminology definitions and linguistic standards. So it's based on rigorous methods and well-known established knowledge engineering methods. Then we can use these co concepts to define rules for our um, legal rules and legal constraints. For example, sufficiency of disclosure. Um, it is obligatory that each inventive concept of a patent is disclosed 
lawfully, all the things which we use now in such sentences have a predefined semantics. So machines can make interpretations of that. They know what an inventive concept is. They know that the relation of A has um, a certain uh, relation between these two, uh, two concepts, inventive concept of a patent, uh, disclosed lawfully is defined, and so on. Enablement uh, requirement, for example, it is obligatory that patent specifications enable a person of uh, ordinary skill and um, creativity, which basically then synonym would be for CETAR, to make the claimed invention and use the claimed invention. We could add even site constraints like uh, with undue exp uh, experimentation and so on. So that's, that's the underlying idea of how you can define semantics, and the important part here is we define the whole semantics in natural language as a kind of interface for domain experts, because domain experts wouldn't use the formal representation, the mathematical or um, first order logic representation. They want to use the language which, which they already know. This can be even further broken down into definitions, which, for example, then take concepts of the mathematical model and then uh, the concepts of the mathematical model can be related to concepts in this natural language representation because uh, usually the domain experts wouldn't use the mathematical symbols. So as I said, if we have the semantics, the uh, interesting thing here is that because we have the semantics, there are almost no semantic ambiguities we can translate now into XML representations for better machine processing, machine publishing, um, for example, in these languages which are standardized by OASIS for legal XML, yes, legal XML representation, and then we can further translate that into the platform-specific models, into the logical representations. Because the semantics is known, it's easy then to translate, for example, such natural language semantic statements into uh, first order logic statements or subsets of first order logic statements. So to summarize this approach, which is one possible approach for representing knowledge in the IS system, of course um, other approaches are um, supported as well. As I said, with this user interface entities, knowledge representation user inter interface entities, the benefits of this approach is we use human-oriented natural language but this language has a clear formal logical semantics which allows machine interpretation. The whole approach is standardized in established knowledge representation methods in ISO and OMG, OASIS, and so on. The semantics allows isomorphic map mappings from this natural language into formal representations which then can be directly used by existing inference engines. The whole benefit of providing such mappings into formal languages, including the mathematical representations, as we will hear as well, is that it supports autom automated or semi-automated logical reasoning, in particular, for example, detecting contradictions and inconsistencies in the definitions. So if you made a mistake in your definitions in this, all these relations, that's automatically uh, spotted by the inference engine. You can map that into existing ontologies, legal ontologies, for example, and you can do this rule-based reasoning so that you can build these legal argument chains in an automated way. The drawbacks, of course, there's an upfront modeling effort that has some costs. Um, so you need to define the semantic vocabulary, you need to give the definitions, you need to provide uh, references to these definitions, so you need to analyze, for example, patent law, substantive patent law, and come up with the precise definitions of these terms. And the structure of this English is limited according to the semantics which we define. So what's not defined in the semantics, in this vocabulary, cannot be used in the language. Nevertheless, that might not be a drawback because often you want to define the higher levels, blueprints of such a legal argument language, whereas then the concrete instantiations, which are, for example, arguments coming from a particular text snippet in a patent or a textual provision in law, um, that can be an instantiation of a particular concept which you defined. Like lawful disclosure is the concept which I defined, and now I can give a reference as source to a particular textual provision where then uh, lawyers, if they use that, can, instead of using this concept which is defined in the language, replace that with the whole textual provision. So that's the underlying year. 
which means the language itself, the structure is limited, but uh, the concrete information which we use is not limited at all. Okay, thank you. <laughs>